the Westboro Baptist Church is is the church that uh, back in in the early '90s started a campaign um, that they called the God Hates Fags campaign. My father was a what I call a hyper Calvinist. He, would, he believed that the Bible was the literal, inspired, inerrant Word of God, and that he was the sole source of interpretation and, and understanding of what the Bible was saying. As far as he was concerned, the rest of the world got it wrong, which is, as I got older, I, I realized was a, a common misconception amongst churches. Well, he was a literalist when he talked about the church, the idea that uh, men had authority over women and that uh, physical corporal punishment was an integral part of bringing up a child. The fact that he used a uh, what was called a mattock, it's got a double head on the end of a, a large, maybe four and a half foot thick piece of wood. And one end of the head is an ax, the other end is a hoe. And that's what he would use to uh, discipline his kids when they were oh out of my order. God. It set things up such that we were pretty much isolated from the rest of the world. You know, any family members were over time were kicked out. He isolated us from his parents. He believed that the world outside was evil and that he wasn't gonna let his kids be influenced. Wow. It's interesting that you, it was one of the things I was going to ask you about was the violence because from the documentaries I've seen, so obviously there were the Louis Theroux, there was one by a guy called Jeremy Kyle. Uh, and there's been a lot of talk on sort of Joe Rogan show um, with Megan, for example. Megan was on Joe Rogan. Yeah. I very rarely hear anything about the violence and yes. reading your website, it was immediately clear to me. And I think what's, What's, it's almost dangerous because the, the shows I've seen, and, I, and I, I mean this sort of with a pinch of salt, but it's dangerous because they almost come across as very funny and witty. And yes. your sister, Shirley, is, is very funny uh, and biting and acerbic. And I suppose your father was as well. So quick, uh, Shirley. I saw there were, there were times when people are driving past and shouting stuff, and she has replied to them before they've even shouted it. She's that fast. You know, you love to hate them because of that. And I think if you saw one moment of what goes on behind closed doors, any of that cuteness goes away immediately. Yeah, you're right. This new generation, my nieces and nephews, they grew up in a different reality. Not to say that it's any less controlling and any less destructive as far as personal individual rights and, and having any kind of capacity to decide for yourself what you're going to do with your life. There just isn't that component of physical violence and raging and a, an environment of constant fear at that level. I'm, I would suggest that there's plenty of fear inside those uh, young people that, you know, that next generation, hmm. but it's more the, um, the doctrinal, those that left, God's going to get you and you're going to burn for eternity to hell, that kind of fear, existential fear. But our generation, you know, the, the, the children of Fred Phelps, that was a completely different environment. I remember um, Megan actually contacting um, my, my older brother, Mark, and I, because she was struggling through finally coming to terms with the fact, because in that closed system, I was just evil. I was always the troublemaker. I was making stuff up. And, and so as these kids are growing to adulthood, that's what they know of me. But Megan asked us, and uh, she was pretty upset. She was destroyed that this myth that she saw, this myth of her grandfather, and I imagine to some degree her mother, um, was just that, that they, you know, there was an ugly, darker backside to the story than, than what she believed growing up. Wow. There. Wow. And yeah. she got in, in touch how long after leaving the church? Well, she reached out to me. Uh, like within a week before my father passed. So five years ago, six years ago. So March of 2014. Okay. Um, do, you, do you keep in touch? Not anymore. We, uh, that's kind of a sad story because that original phone call was her telling me that she had had the opportunity as my father was, was fading away. He was in a, a, a hospice care by then. It, from the sounds of it, his mind was, was almost gone. You know, he'd, but he'd have um, salient moments. Um, and so she had some emotional time there to, to say goodbye to him. And had those who had left 
with apparently the exception of Megan and Grace, were being kept out away from him, which was kind of, I never wanted to go in and see him because it, I just made that assumption. You know, you're once you're out, you're out. Why would they bend the rules all of a sudden just because he was dying? Sure. But a lot of them really wanted that opportunity to see him at the end. And so I tried to negotiate, you know, with people I hadn't spoken to in years and they weren't budging. And finally I said, look, if you're not going to let him in, then I'm going to have to uh, let the, the media know that, that, in fact, he is there. Because there was a lot of speculation, you know, people were saying, oh, is he, is he uh, sick? Is he, nobody's seen him for a while and that kind of stuff. And I had a couple of reporters there in Topeka who were hounding me pretty regularly. And generally speaking, I would just say to him, I don't know anything, right? Well, suddenly I know something. So I tried to use that as a negotiating tool and they weren't having it. So I ended up um, contacting the, those media guys and telling them that, yeah, in fact, he was there. A negotiating so tool a, for, for what? To be, to be allowed in to say your goodbyes? Yes. Was that on, on behalf of your other, or your relatives? On behalf of my, my siblings. You didn't want to. Who wanted to. Like Why my, were they letting my, Megan in and not anyone else? I don't know. You got to understand there was, there was a very unique relationship, had been since I was a child, between Shirley and our father. Yeah. She was clearly the one who worshipped him and wanted to be like him. Megan was clearly the one who was being groomed as the next generation. There was an intimacy there that wasn't there with, with a lot of the other kids. So what actually went on? Because I think there was a lot of back and forth about the truth. About So it's said that he went out to the Rainbow House across the street and said, you're, you're good people. And as a result, was excommunicated. Is that right? I had a conversation with one of my uh, nephews who says that he, they were standing out actually on the porch of the church. And so they're within maybe 100, 150 feet of that uh, rainbow house. He um, was in a thoughtful mood and he made that comment in front of my nephew. I also know as hearsay that my father uh, degenerated into some form of dementia in the final okay. years, that he was put into a house, was left isolated there, but there's also a thread that I heard enough that I'm convinced it was a key part of their decision. And that is that he um, had gotten soft, as they put it, because it was a very extreme, rigid. See, but another piece you got to understand about this, Andrew, is that there's a lot of judgment in that environment because you're looking and seeing, does this, does this behavior fit or violate some part of the word of God? That was drummed into us. You know, if, you know them by their fruit, that, that kind of language. They were ever vigilant. It's just that he built that system up so effectively. So he starts showing signs of weakening and then not being that warrior for God, that he's slipping away from the faith. It makes perfect sense from what I grew up with. That that's exactly what they would do. And it was absolute. It was thorough. It was complete. He was uh, reprobate. And they weren't going to have him running that organization anymore. He wow. had created this monster and it had turned on him, right? It's funny that he, I don't know if he didn't see that coming or I can't imagine him mellowing because he's, he was so ag aggressive and maybe mm -hmm. repressed. I think that my father did what he did deliberately. Um, he thought he was doing the right thing. My father had a very positive, normal childhood. His mother uh, died of cancer, I think, when he was five years old. So some people point to that as maybe the, a pivotal point in the development of his emotional self. But he was, an, he was a bright student, got straight A's. He was a, an Eagle Scout that uh, did it all. He ended up at the age of 17 graduating. He was, uh, he was the class valedictorian. He showed tendencies towards this uh, get in your face, kick them in the knee and watch how they react kind of approach to other humans, right? Well, he so, went on to do some pretty horrible things. Um, let me ask you this. Um, I noticed as I, as I get older that I see more and more of my own parents' characteristics and idiosyncrasies in my, my own personality, ones that are wanted and ones that are perhaps not. Do you feel any part of your, your father in you, um, or is there nothing like that? That's a good question. That's really insightful. Far too much. I 
fret about that. I established my sometimes too rigid boundaries as far as my behavior because I'll see something in me that reminds me of something that I despised in him. I'll move heaven and earth to avoid mm. giving it voice or giving it a, a breath. His tendency to go to violence, we grew up with that. And so we understood as children that that was the way the world was. You know, we're, we're not good at separating out and, and critically analyzing what's going on around us until we, you know, get up to eight, 10 years old, right? So we just take this in and this is the way the world is. This is, if he behaves this way, we behave this way. So there was a lot of that. It was a very violent, it wasn't just coming from my father. We defaulted to violent behavior. So you come out into the real world, whether or not you are predisposed that direction, you're still going to give it attention. In a frustrating moment, I would give myself permission to behave that way. And then you get to live the real world consequences where you don't control everybody. And mm -hmm. then one day it dawns on you, no, I don't have permission to be physically violent towards other humans. It's not okay. Was there any real moment <laughs> uh, where something blew up like that? I haven't talked about it a lot, but there was an inclination when I first left home to lash out at gay people. Because again, that's what we grew up with. That's an easy target because God hates them, right? So what sort of Never. thing would happen? Would you be walking down the street and maybe see someone who was openly exhibiting homosexual behavior? Well, no, it was actually a little bit more deliberate and, uh, and um, aggressive on my part. I, 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 I was spending time with friends who mm. were, you know, we were in our, our late teens, early 20s. I had run away from home. Um, and there was a place in Kansas City called Liberty, Liberty Circle at a big park there. Yeah. And it was a well-known place to hang out. So we'd go up there and just harass them. And if it turned into a bit of violence, so be it, right? Um, again, I gave myself permission. It was okay. I wasn't, this was something I understood was bad. So I had a right to, to uh, behave that way. So you grow up with a lot of really stupid ideas about how what's okay and what's not okay as far as how you treat other humans. It's almost like an experiment of of how how not to bring up a human child into this world, and and yet you're so eloquent and so is Megan and so is Shirley and so these are not a bunch of idiots. These are smart people, really smart people who've got an answer to everything and. So, so you were brought up well in that sense, I suppose. Mm -hmm. but, uh, well, that's what, that's what you got to understand is we were in the pews from the day we were born and you know, brought home from, from uh, the hospital. And that wasn't an accident. He was adamant about that. No, they're going to be sitting there six hours every Sunday. And uh, if one of them acted up because they were hungry or whatever, then they'd get swatted when he would be up there behind the pulpit. He had us all um, memorize the, the books of the Bible in order. Uh, when he would call out a verse, then you better get there quick, because if you're the last one still shuffling through the pages to find the verse, then wow. you might get his attention and as a result, get smacked upside the head by someone sitting next to you. He set it up deliberately that way, right? As we got older, he had us even start editorializing what we thought maybe that verse meant or how it tied into some doctrine or, or other. A lot of folks can't defend their beliefs, but we grew up by God, we better be able to defend our beliefs. Right. So um, well, you get that's beaten. what you see out there on those picket lines. You may well, disagree with how they're interpreting a, a passage or interpreting an idea that exists in the Bible, but by God, they'll be able to defend it. Were you good at defending it? It's funny because when I'm, talking with people on Twitter or on social media, they'll put up a verse or they'll, or they'll pose a question about, um, you know, why did God do this or why is it this way? And I can come back in an instance with an explanation from the Calvinist point of view. So can we try it? Okay. Um, okay. So why would God, if, you know, if he made us in his image, why would he make us gay? Well, the, the broad stroke, if you don't have anything immediately to respond to, you say, you, you have no business asking questions about why God does what he does. 
He's okay. almighty. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He, hmm. he exists in all places and all times. Okay. He understands what's going on a lot better than you do. Then why do we need you guys? The Bible says to cry <laughs> out with a loud voice. See, they'll, they're, they're very simple answers. They're basically saying, God tells us, this is what we're supposed to do. It doesn't need to make sense to you, you puny human. <laughs> <laughs> Would you know that? Do you know the Bible off by heart? The entire Bible? No. But a lot of but stuff. But I, I know the books of the Bible, and I can still spout them in less than 20 seconds. I can do that. Wow. I get it, man. I mean, I, look, I grew up in a Jewish family. Nothing compared to what, what you're talking about. But on Sundays, I had to go and learn to read Hebrew. And a lot of it, it stays with you, you know, or a lot of that stuff. But I do remember being 13 or 14, and I was sitting in a synagogue. I was whispering or something, and, and somebody turned around and shushed me and said, like, have some respect, the rabbi's talking. And that was my moment of, I felt like I don't want to give him respect. He's, mm-hmm. he's talking complete gibberish. And he's welcome yeah. to do that as much as he wants. But why am I here being forced to come here on a Sunday and I've got to listen to him? And why are we giving him respect? Because that's really all there is. If you can't, if you can't develop the facade around uh, religious ideas, then you got nothing. Yeah, yeah. Are you an atheist now? Yes, sir. I've seen you are um, uh, an advocate of LGBT rights. Yes, sir. Is that like is that like your albatross around your neck? Is that your? No, it's just one of those things where I grew up with a certain idea. Spent a short period of time being aggressively anti-gay, destructively anti-gay. I hopefully, didn't do too much harm during that time. I don't recall ever actually hurting anybody beyond throwing maybe a soda at them. It wasn't until I started speaking out against my family and getting contacts from literally thousands of gay people, thousands of people who who grew up in environments similar to mine as far as religious beliefs, there were people who were were suffering. And hearing all these people talk and getting their stories, it just occurred to me that um, because of the circumstances of what the Westboro Baptist Church was doing, it was just a natural fit for me to counter their arguments about homosexuality. When did you accept gays? Was, was there a moment or was it a gradual process? Yeah, it's always gradual. And I ha- the truth of the matter is I have to go back to when I was in Southern California, living in Orange County there, California went through, I think, at least three different votes in trying to decide whether they were going to allow gay marriage there. And even then I was advocating for it, not standing on the streets with signs, but was already advocating that, you know, we really don't have any real rational justification. This was long before I became atheist, at least publicly. Uh, So the ideas were already formed there because when you really, when it comes down to, if if you just give it rational thought, rational inquiry, let go of the Bible for a minute, set that over there. Let's just let it sit. We know what it says. Now let's just go out there and see what evidence we have exclusive of the Bible. There's absolutely no justification for treating this particular group of people different than the rest. It's just what's in us. It's our fear, it's our anxiety, and then it gets codified in some religious book, and suddenly we have justification for treating people bad. Yeah. So. There seems to be an obsession with sodomy. <laughs> right. I don't, I don't know what that is, man. And then they just don't quite know what to say about the women, right? Because mm. it's... That, that latest documentary, when Louis went back the third time, it, it yeah. looked very different and it looked like it had turned into sort of a boys club. Maybe not as interesting as they once were. And I think Louis picked up on this as well, that they now seem just like any other cult. Uh, they didn't have the same wit as your father had and, and Shirley, who's been pushed to the side. And it's now just sort of these men uh, lording it over the women. And that's all it really is. Well, I don't know if, you, if you've uh, come across this yet, but that's what caused Megan and, and Grace to leave. Because they grew up around their mother. She was their mother. She was their hero in many ways, right? And yes, in fact, she was, except maybe my father's charismatic aspect. She was the reason that place was so successful. That campaign was so successful. She worked tirelessly. She was intelligent, like you said. She was sharp. She was was Fred Jr. in, in that regard, right? And then when the old man started losing his grip, they, yeah, there was a power struggle. There was a power vacuum. And so they voted eight men in as a deaconship. They became the power. And in that process, 
they slapped Shirley down. I said, you're in violation of, uh, you know, the passages in Timothy that say, I suffer not a woman to speak, so sit down and shut up or you're going to be kicked out of the church. That's a terrible PR move because, frankly, nobody really wants to watch Steve drain. And I think people were fixated on your sister. Yeah. Yeah, but, but they're, you know, that's not going to be an argument for them. Um, I think that they thought the PR would be there just because of who they were, no matter what. And you're right. It bit them in the backside. There was a great uh, extract online, uh, which, which was beautifully written about the moment that you left uh, at midnight on your 18th birthday. Would you be able to yeah. talk me through that? Okay, so you got to go back a few years. My older brother, Mark, had left. Like I said, it was such a controlled, tight, closed system. And our father was telling us very early on that this is what we're going to do. We're going to finish high school. We're going to go to Washburn University, finish Washburn University. We're going to go to Washburn Law School. And then we're going to roll into Phelps Chartered, which was the law firm that he had, right? Yeah. And that's just the way it was going to be. Nobody really spent a lot of time challenging that because who are you going to challenge? <laughs> there was the extreme physical violence, which was how he enforced all of these rules. But then as the kids grew up and you know got into their late teens, they kind of got a mind of their own. So first of all, Fred Jr., he takes off. So each kid in, the, in turn, as they, as they come of age, they, you know, they're feeling their oats. Well, the old man has to clamp down hard and fast or else this is going to turn into outright re revolt, you know. So he threatens Fred Jr. at one point even with a gun. Um, Jesus. And, uh, and then Fred disappears for a couple of semesters. He's, he's uh, discovered up at Kansas State University. Meanwhile, the girlfriend who the fight was all over ends up committing suicide. Oh, my word. And so Fred's up at, at Kansas State licking his wounds and, and trying to figure out where he's going to go. And he's taking classes and he meets Betty. He finally is convinced because Betty's a good church girl. So he thinks, OK, now this one he'll accept. So he finally comes back and the old man does accept her grudgingly at first. But she's a good Christian girl. She's going to need some adjustments, but she'll work out. And then Mark... The next one in line, because his grades are slipping and that you don't let that happen. Right. Oh. There's, a, there's violence to pay if you're, if you're What not. would he do if he saw, so you come home and you've got a bad grade? That happened once with myself and my younger brother, John, and we ended up in, in a police station the next afternoon and they're taking pictures of our backside, black and blue from the bottom of our back all the way down to behind our knees. And they brought charges against the old man for that, but they ended up... Um, dropping them because that was the nature of things back in those years. That would have been in the early seventies, right? Yeah. So Mark decides that he can't stay hmm. and he runs away. The old man tracks him down, forces him back home. As right. they get home, there's a legal client waiting at the door because his law office was also in that same building. So as my old man's distracted with the legal client, Mark walks through the office, through the church and back out the back door and disappears uh, and he managed to stay gone so that was the first time I actually entertained the idea that maybe there's a way out I was 16 at the times and I knew the old man's position was that he owned us until we were 18 so I just kept it close to the chest and as 17 and a half rolled around I, I bought a, an old car from the security cop at the high school there's an old Rambler classic kept parked down the road so nobody knew I had it. You know, I'd move it every once in a while so it didn't get towed. Yeah. And then when no one was looking, I slowly um, started packing what little belongings I had. And on the night of my 18th birthday, acted like I went to bed, 10.30ish or so, and everything was quiet and everybody was asleep. I snuck outside, ran down and got the car, backed it into the driveway and then rolled up the garage door and loaded up all the stuff into the back end. A few days before, I was uh, friends with a guy who owned a gas station that was just adjacent to the high school that I went to and told him what I was planning. And he said, look, you can stay in the bathroom, but because of the way the place is set up, the entire front of the building is glass. The bathroom is, you know, when you open the door of the bathroom, it, you come right out into that open area. So you basically have to stay in the bathroom, lights off, until I get here in the morning, right? Because someone sees you wandering around there, then it's going to 
they're going to uh, think that there's a crime going on and oh my it'll God. be a mess. So, so I go back in the house and I uh, slip into the dining room, which was there were the stairs going up to my father's room kind of intruded right into the dining room space of the, of the house. And I stood there and, and uh, watched the clock rise up till, till midnight. And uh, as soon as it hit midnight, I pumped my fist, let out a yell and headed out the back door. Your heart must have been there. going at a million miles an hour. Yeah. Oh yeah. It was terrifying, but there was a way out. See, that was the whole thing for me is there's actually, I can escape now. There's, I don't have to worry about any kind of repercussions for that. Boy, was I naive. <laughs> you know, it doesn't take you long to realize you can't really run away from that stuff, right? Because it's all in your head. It was the constant anxiety that either someone was going to show up and figure out a way to force me back into that situation, or God was going to have his revenge because that was one of the things we understood would happen if you left. God was going to punish you. He was going to make sure that you got back here. Sure. And that's one of the reasons why everybody else ended up going back, or most everybody else did, because something bad in the environment would happen. In our world, right. that meant God was pissed. They attributed it to an act of God. Yes. So, you know, I, I lived for a time for about a year with my sister Margie. Okay. And something bad happened, and she ended up going back home, and she never left again. So something bad happened. I think it was with a man. And that was God punishing her. So back she went. Um, it never leaves you. Yeah, no, it doesn't. Gain new insight and manage it differently, right? Yeah, that's all you can do, I suppose. That goes back to what I was saying before about you realize you inherit your parents' attributes. And I guess you can't really change it. I think you wind yourself up too much. So you just go, okay, that's, that's okay. And I'm just aware of it. Yeah, but you can change how you behave even if you do have that character in you you can change how you behave and that's where my focus was right yeah and it's, it seems like you've succeeded yeah but it's not it's not an all win all lose situation right i mean you sh there's scars there's destructive behavior that uh and see here's here's where it's most frustrating is you don't know what's you and what's uh the stuff that was implanted mm -hmm. in you right so ultimately, you just have to take responsibility for all of it as far as how you behave and uh, try to carry on. I think you could be very proud. I mean, you, you came from one of the most notorious uh, sects in the world. You could have just escaped and lived your life uh, as it was, but you're going out there and fighting for LGBT rights and everything. So I think that's something you could be immensely proud of. Yeah. Do you, do you remember your, your father in any way fondly? Hmm. No. <laughs> I mean, there, there were, uh, there were a couple of times when I was a young child, like I remember I had to go to the hospital for something. I don't know what it was. And when I got home from the hospital, he put me up on his bed. I was probably four or five years old and I got to lay in his bed for some period of time while they were feeding me ice cream. So I'm assuming it was maybe tonsils or something. And then there was another time that we were out on the edge of town and he had stopped at a junkyard and they had one of these old, you know, like, I don't even know what you'd call it. Mm. It was a curved roof building, metal building. Okay. I think I know what and you mean. And I'm sitting outside in the car waiting and it's freezing outside. And at some point in that process, he came out, got me out of the car and walked me into that dark oily smelling building and set me beside the, the fire they had burning in a can. And those are two of the positive experiences where I felt like, you know, he was conscious of um, my needs and acted on them. But that's, you know, that's pretty sparse. If you could say something to, to him now, what would you say? Here's the thing. It's like when he passed, just like my mom passed just a few months ago, ah. um, there's an expectation that there's going to be those emotions because most folks are normal, right? Yeah. They lose a, a, loved, a loved one and there's, there's emotions. But what folks don't understand is in the process of separating yourself and of uh, protecting yourself after you're cut off from everything that you grew up with and everything that you know, I remember actually I was in, in uh, counseling at the time. and 
the counselor suggested that I actually write my goodbyes as though they died. Okay. And I, I went through that process. It was just, you know, to me, it was just following the instructions of the counselor. But, uh, you know, looking back in retrospect, that was me mourning the loss of my family. Uh, by the time he passed, and by the time my mom passed, the only thing left is sadness over what might have been. Well, that opportunity is gone. But you have your own family now. I have three biological. I, I raised uh, my stepdaughter from the age of three. Oh. They didn't know about it. Interestingly enough, it wasn't until they were adults. I just didn't think it was right to put that on them. You know, and they're adults now. They have the capacity to reason. And if they come across stuff and they want to talk about it, I'll talk to them about it. But how did your, your experience with your father, how has that changed you as a father? Well, you know, they say we either become them or we become the opposite of them. <laughs> yeah. I made, it, I made it my mission to be the opposite of him. So that would be one huge way that it impacted it. One of his philosophies was to isolate us, to keep us away from the evil world. So my philosophy was that I was going to see to it that my kids were wholly immersed in the society that they were growing up in, right? And as a result, I actually ended up joining a church when they were young because I thought that that was a necessary part of them feeling like they were normal. Are you a good father? Mm. Hope so. <laughs>